We are here today with Lars Mary, and I'm sure that I killed your last name. I apologize in advance from Canada Park Farmer. And where are you guys located? We are based in Aachen, that in Germany is uh, 30 minutes away from the big city Cologne. Okay. Um, so you're outside the big city of Cologne, and that in itself, uh, I have never heard Cologne call it the big city, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about perspective, right? Um, so That's tell true. us. Tell us a little bit about um, why did you choose to get into medicinal cannabis? Yes, yeah, so um, first of all, thanks for being here. My name is uh, Lars Möhring. I'm the co-founder and current CEO of Planify Pharma. Um, I have a background in economics. I studied international business in the Netherlands. And um, back in 2017, I came across um, the medical cannabis therapy right when my um, aunt suffered from breast cancer. I um, endowed the field of medical cannabis and uh, yeah, acknowledged that there is much to do, especially in the big upcoming German market. Um, that led us to the uh, formulation and the establishment of our um, company back in early 2018. Then we went into stealth mode, um, managed to get all the advisors on board, uh, secure all the licenses. And now since uh, the beginning of 2020, we are fully operating with the aim of uh, becoming one of the, um, yeah, hopefully leaders in the uh, German or European market with the aim of um, vertically integrating ourselves, launching our own medical brand and partnering up with those companies who managed to have a, um, big um, big standing already in the market. That is what we're doing and that is uh, very short about my background and how I got into this uh, business. Um, so while I understand that you um, have been operating it since the beginning of the year, um, it won't be until next year that you'll actually have product in the market. Is that correct? That is correct. So um, right now we are in the process of creating our new our own new CI and the design of our medical brand. We're in the process of getting our Canadian LP GMP certified and um, we're in the process of the um, product development, which we want to bring to Germany and hopefully to the whole European market. Um, but yeah, you're right, given the fact uh, that we are exposed to the COVID-19 situation that um, third country inspections from the German federal authorities are not um, allowed at this point in time, we will have to delay that until uh, Q1 or Q2 next year. We're currently in the process of investigating whether a remote inspection is possible um, with the um, German authorities. But as you might know from my predecessors that, has been, uh, that have been on your show, um, we have a federal state system and every regulatory um, authority in Germany handles their, um, their regula regulatory framework in a, different, um, in a different way. So we're currently investigating that, whether it is possible or not. But hopefully um, we're, we're bringing our products into Germany uh, Q1 or Q2 next year. And that begins to speak about the complexity of the cannabis market in Europe. Not only do you have 28 different member states with 28 different sets of rules and regulations, um, countries like Germany have a you know region by region sort of um, approach to it and, as well. So it's not just simply being a German company is enough, right? So you have to look at each different region and what the requirements of each region. What are some of the other challenges with um, that you ran into? You've been working on this um, for about two years. Um, what are some of the other challenges in trying to get this done? Yeah, so um, just recently, um, as it was released in the news, um, given the um, federalism in Germany, um, it was not clear in the beginning whether um, companies have to label their products or not. So when talking about Dutch flour from, uh, from Betelkan, um, they are, were usually labeled in the uh, Dutch language, but for the end consumer, for the patient, um, some federal uh, states um, basically decided that it is not uh, compliant with the German um, pharmaceutical law. Therefore, uh, importers and distributors like ourselves had to label these products in the German language to make it um, to 
make it more easy to um, read for the patients and for the pharmacists. But that was decided in our, in our state, in our province. Other states at the same time had not to do that. Um, that is like a short introduction about how the federalism system in, in Germany works. Um, it would be much of a, a benefit for the, for the uh, medical cannabis ecosystem if all uh, states would decide on um, how to handle medical cannabis since it is obviously completely new to the regulator. Um, whether it is declared as an API, whether it is um, declared as a, um, as a flower or whatever. And um, that yeah, I mean, we're beyond the, the federal system, we'd love to see that European wide and get an EU standard uh, for you know standardization for labeling and other products. Yeah, I think, uh, at least to my perception, it's of utmost importance to get a uh, standardized uh, regulatory framework um, that can also serve as a blueprint for other uh, European countries, since um, Germany has done an impressive work so far for three to four years of uh, legalization for the medical cannabis sector but it still has a lot of work to do. Um, I think we will touch upon that later when we talk about plant standardization, but um, it all begins with the regulatory framework and that needs to be in the right place in order for companies to scale their businesses and in order for patients to um, receive their medicine on a, or to rely on their medicine. And what is the approach as far as, you know, developing evidence-based um, studies or trials um, to continue to expand the, the product line. Yeah, so education is a uh, big concern right now in the medical cannabis field. Um, clinical trials are mostly conducted from big pharmaceutical um, companies with the aim of um, receiving a patent for the uh, for their findings. You cannot obtain that within the medical cannabis field since it is a plant that is available for everyone. In order to receive a patent, you would have to basically come up with an um, innovation and uh, yeah, conduct a clinical trial and to, to deliver evidence. Um, that makes it for doctors even harder, which are generally biased towards the medical uh, cannabis therapy. Um, since in most cases or in conventional medicine, uh, doctors have clinical evidence they can rely on and um, coping or connecting um, missing clinical studies and um, evidence with a, a general bias towards the um, medical cannabis therapy is one of the biggest concerns we're facing so far in the um, German cannabis ecosystem, which we're trying to um, eliminate. And what about from the payers' perspective, right? Are they willing to reimburse this? Um, what are the challenges there? So from the health insurance's perspective? Yes. Yeah, so um, basically you, you may have uh, heard of that the uh, health insurances came up with a new price regulation just um, in the first quarter of this year where they set the uh, maximum reimbursement price at a rate of €9.52 for um, cannabis flowers. Um, this came out of nowhere basically for um, pharmacists and um, reduced the standard reimbursement price, which was at a time at around 20 to 25 euro per gram at a lower cost of let's say 17 to 18 euro. Um, this shows the um, interest of the health insurances to come up with a way more efficient, safer to use, and also cost efficient way of, um, of um, reimbursing uh, medical cannabis products, um, which also might be an indicator of why the um, full spectrum extracts are the most um, increasing subcategory of medical cannabis flowers, uh, products that we can obtain right now in the, in the German market. Um, I hope that answers your questions. Otherwise, I have to rephrase. No, that's fine. Um, but just to take that a little bit further is, you know, where does that leave the German patient as far as how much of a burden do they have to, if, is the reimbursement limited to a, a percentage and then they have to make up the difference? 
Um, so you, in the daily operating business, you can you can be sure that pharmacists will always aim to um, buy their products or the flowers at a lower cost than the reimbursement price from the health insurances is in order to um, make the patient stay away from um, having to pay extra on their medicine. That is how the healthcare system works and that should also be the um, pharmacist's goal that, the, um, that a patient that has a health insurance or a cost acquisition granted from the health insurances um, should not pay um, a uh, price premium for the medicine. Um, that puts obviously a lot of cost pressure on uh, LPs from outside of Europe and um, also on the distributors, which um, have to um, give discounts on their flowers and um, yeah. And, and a lot of the people that will see this video are from uh, North America and where mm -hmm. um, the you know, so the concept of a drugstore, a national chain, doesn't exist in the apothec in, in Germany, right? So what we have in Germany is, you know, small businesses, small mom and pops. I think it, what the limit is four that they can own. Any single owner can have four apothecaries. Mm. Um, Which I'm is not aware of that, but I know bigger chains for sure. That are yeah, I mean, so similar. what we don't see is we don't see Walgreens or anything like that, like we see in the U.S., Right, so there's, you know, the apothecary system is much different. What kind of challenges does that pose to you as a distributor? Um, yeah, so when operating in the in the daily business, you have to make sure that you um, somehow um, identify the um, pharmacist as a gateway, since he's um, very much connected to the prescribing doctor and to the patient. Um, and especially like you mentioned, um, we do have bigger um, pharmacy associations in Germany as well. So where they do the, um, where they do a generic um, buying process for, a, um, for the economies of scale so that they can buy their products as a, as a lower uh, cost rate. Um, but yeah, you really have to, um, basically um, build up a strong relationship with the pharmacist and um, try to reach out to the patients and to the prescribing doctors through the, um, through the help of the pharmacist. And a pharmacist is obtaining different pain points right now in Germany. So um, he, wants to, uh, he wants to obtain a constant quality for the flower. So he does not want to um, have seeds delivered with his, um, with his delivery. Um, he needs to um, have a constant lead time. So um, in some cases, especially when um, ordering flour from, the, um, from Canada, in some points, uh, pharmacists told me that they had to make a, a purchase order two months in advance. And uh, when the flowers arrived in Germany, they had a shelf life of around... Um, two to three months, which is for the pharmacist way too, um, way too low and does make, it, does make it impossible for him to build up an inventory, which on the other hand would um, benefit the patients when he does not have to uh, call the pharmacist um, in advance with his prescription, checking whether the um, pharmacist has um, the flower in stock, but rather can make sure that the flower is all the time in stock. Given a um, uh, given a longer sh uh, shelf life. So obviously, when we look at Europe, German is a, Germany is a very hot market, um, and this is a market that you're participating in. How do you position yourself or differentiate yourself? Because obviously, there's a uh, pretty <coughs> substantial competitive landscape. Yeah, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's amazing how this um, relatively new market has developed within uh, three years. Um, it is highly fragmented, highly competitive. Um, lots of businesses um, occurred out of the nowhere that are pursuing the uh, same strategic positioning so that they want to um, import Dutch flour and dispense it among pharmacies. Um, for us, 
that is the gateway in order to receive, so that we could receive all the necessary licenses. So the NAC could take the wholesaler's license. But within the next steps, we are putting a much more emphasis on the product development and on the actual uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing of our own products. So that is why we are, as Kenify Pharma, we will be launching our own medical brand um, in quarter one or quarter two next year, depending on the um, inspect date we are getting from the authorities. And then we want to make sure that we position our brand, our own medical brand um, in the German pharmacies and further expand it to other, um, to other European countries that serve with a legal basis for um, a medical cannabis treatment. Um, since that is also something that we are, um, that we are um, currently facing in Germany, that is that we have a huge demand for plant standardization. Um, German patients and uh, pharmacists are exposed to regular product recalls in, in Germany. Um, as you might know, we have a um, set standard deviation of uh, around of, um, 10% that is um, put on the THC or CBD amount and um, full spectrum extracts as well as uh, flowers cannot fulfill those uh, standard deviation or cannot lie within this range for every batch. And that is something that makes it, um, that is our goal to provide a more standardized product of a um, superior quality to the pharmacists and to the patients at a competitive pricing obviously. And then you mentioned that you hope to um, move beyond Germany. What will be your approach to choosing new markets and, and expanding? So um, first of all, I have to admit that we are um, that we have lots to do still um, in Germany. So um, sure. it is not possible that we are. Uh, it is maybe not the best goal to um, just try to copy and paste the way we are um, operating in Germany right now to another market um, like Poland or Italy. That is why we are currently evaluating um, entry strategies for us how to um, enter those relevant and big markets. Um, we're not sure whether it will be through a strategic partnership, whether it will be through a uh, joint venture, or if we will um, found um, and establish a subsidiary. Um, but once we're set with the German market and once we are um, left our footprint in Germany, we will come up with um, expanding strategies for other countries. And then, um, you know, because, you know, do you expect to sort of see a, a repeat of what we've seen in North America with the green rush, right? You mentioned there's lots of people pursuing this German opportunity. Um, what's your thought? Like, is this a bubble or, or is there just so much demand that there's enough for everyone so you're talking about the demand in germany right yeah what, what i'm saying is you had mentioned earlier that there's a lot of companies now trying to pursue this right so it's a very competitive fragmented landscape um, is your expectation that you know there will be um you know players that will fall by the wayside and that the market will consolidate mm, so the market will consolidate for sure um, but I cannot tell you right now um, in how it will look like. So um, whether acquisitions will happen of smaller distributors, um, since uh, other, other companies um, are seeing them as a um, opportunity to um, receive a larger amounts from the, from the Netherlands, according to the import quota, um, or if they just will, um, go bankrupt. I cannot tell that uh, right now. What I can tell you for sure is that uh, more companies will be entering the, uh, the German medical cannabis market. I know a few companies that are um, just about to receive their licenses and will um, try to enter this uh, competitive landscape. But what um, I think amazing to see is that uh, LPs from all over the world are focusing on the German market and um, 
that also other governments are somehow looking at Germany as the blueprint of handling um, their regulatory framework when it comes to the medical cannabis therapy. Um, but um, I cannot uh, <laughs> cannot see in the foreseeable future, but that are my uh, that is my perception, and that is what I'm expecting from the market. Yeah, I mean, we typically look at Germany as being quite stringent in its regulatory policies. So the expectation is that if it works in Germany, it will probably work in other EU countries. Um, I guess I have a question with regard to the the German strategy. It's, it's highly dependent upon importing and exporting um, versus uh, growing product. Obviously the weather and whatnot is a factor, but how will that affect the German market in the long term um, for its dependence on having to import product? Yeah, so um, the German market is now dependent on, on imports for around three years and will probably also be um, the import, uh, will be dependent on imports for the next one and a half year, just um, when the uh, domestic harvesting will start. So we just received the message a few days ago that the uh, domestic harvesting has delayed until the um, beginning of next year. Yeah. Um, even though many, many companies are already arguing that the uh, domestic harvesting uh, quotas are set way too low, that they cannot fulfill the um, the German market demand, but I'm not, I wouldn't be too sure with that. So I think that the domestic harvest um, will put a lot of cost pressure on the German market, will um, contribute to the product diversity, which is generally a good thing, since um, this market can only continue to grow when um, the regulatory framework gets also supported and the uh, market conditions get also supported from the health insurances. And what we clearly can see is um, that the health insurances want to move um, somehow away from these high reimbursement costs and they're looking for cost efficient and um, safe to use um, solutions for the patients and for the whole um, medical healthcare system when it comes to medical cannabis. And you would think also that there's sort of an, an economic development impact of growing it locally, creating jobs and, and things like that. Uh, yeah, of course, there is an, um, there, there is an impact. And we, we obtained three companies that have their um, licenses granted for the domestic harvesting. Um, and really, I cannot tell you whether this is a... Um, according to a cost-benefit analysis, whether this will make sense for the um, local for the local growers to um, harvest their products within Germany. But um, when it comes to, um, to a strategic uh, formulation and to a strategic positioning, this is an amazing opportunity for those companies to uh, be one of the pioneers in Germany so that, um, yeah, that um, grew uh, medical cannabis in Germany. Especially when talking about um, a Germany is a is a market um, that had, is, as you mentioned at the beginning, is very much um, dependent on imports from within Europe and from outside of Europe. And right when the legalization in March of 2017 came across, all of the expertise regarding medical cannabis, whether it is the cultivation. Um, or the um, distributing was um, outside of Europe. So therefore it is amazing to see how this uh, market developed in such a short time span. And um, I think that the domestic harvest is, a, um, is an amazing milestone for this industry. And I understand that you don't have the ability to predict the future, but will Germany entertain recreational? Um, According to politics, unfortunately, I would say I would say no. Okay. So um, we, what we can say is that the um, not existing recreational market will be for sure at some point be um, displayed or fulfilled from the um, from the medical market as well. Um, but it has. 
it does not have the uh, have the possibility to get the same uh, get the same dynamics and the same um, size that a purely recreational market would have. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we've seen, particularly like in the United States, is um, other states begin to jump on board once they see, um, you know, the revenue potential, the, the tax potential. Um, so maybe as other EU countries begin to move into a recreational space, Germany will rethink that, um, you know, mm, for economic for sure. reasons as well. Um, so what, you know, what do you believe will be, you know, the key differentiator in your brand that will make your product different from those that exist in the market or will exist in the market? Yeah, so that will be the, um, the quality and the plant standardization. As I um, mentioned in the beginning, um, plant standardization is a big concern, even three years after the legalization, and that uh, concerns everyone being in the supply chain. So starting with patients, going over to pharmacists, doctors, and even researchers. Um, so patients need to rely on their medicine. There is no one fits all solution for patients. So a patient might um, have to consume a different strain in the morning to come through his day and um, another strain in the evening to cope with his uh, chronic pain, for example. And how are you going to guarantee a safe medical treatment just through plant standardization? That is of utmost importance and is one of the um, key differentiators of our own medical brand. And um, let's talk about doctors. As I mentioned also, they are generally biased towards the medical cannabis treatment and doctors- Biased know, being opposed. Yeah, for example, so that they um, would rather go uh, go and prescribe conventional medicine instead of um, uh, educating themselves in the medical cannabis field and prescribe something that is unknown to them. And um, in order to eliminate that bias, doctors need to know what they are prescribing and what effects the medicine has. Um, also, they they need to know if uh, they need to know. Um, how they can document the um, the um, development of these uh, of the patient's well-being, and that can only be done um, reliably when the plant is standardized and when uh, it has the same effects with every use and with every batch. And is education a key component of your market entry? So will yes, you be doing course. education? We're yeah, of course. So um, education in Germany is a bit tricky um, for for um, physicians or for doctors. Um, Evidence-based trials or clinical trials are the most common way of ensuring that um, a medicine should be prescribed or should be used. Um, I can say right away also with regard to the cost that we will not conduct clinical trials. Um, but what we are trying or what we're doing right now is um, creating a medical um, education system that our medical sales um, sales team will um, bring to the doctors so that they educate them about the benefits and the um, the whole regulatory process that is uh, associated with the medical cannabis treatment and um, put educate them basically about how um, a patient can benefit in the long term or in the long term from uh, a medical cannabis treatment versus conventional medicine. Um, that is are, our aim. Are, are we seeing, you know, sort of the dynamics changing in that are the patients asking for this? Are the patients exploring this on their own as alternatives? Uh, yeah, so that is in, in most cases the the way a uh, patient gets his prescription. So that is also a huge, uh, huge um, point that we are um, discovering right now in, in Germany, that the um, number of patients is rapidly growing and constantly growing, but that the number of prescribing doctors somehow remains the same and that they are building um, hubs for example where um, patients are getting their prescriptions same applies for the for the pharmacies 
and the ultimate goal would be um, would be changing the common way of how um, patients receive their prescriptions so that they do not have to proactively um, approach the doctor, do the education for the doctor and um, tell them about the benefits of the uh, medical cannabis tr treatment, but vice versa, that the, um, the doctor is already educated and um, comes up with the solution of prescribing a medical cannabis treatment by his own instead of the um, patient having to educate and approach him for that. And, and where are these patients educating themselves? Are they unfortunately going on the internet and, and just sort of yeah. relying on whatever they find? Yeah, yeah, that is, I would say, somehow the, uh, besides um, mouth propaganda, the most common source for the information and um, I think I can talk to everyone when your well-being or your overall health is not guaranteed. You will come up with every silly solution to fix your uh, fix your health conditions. And at some point, when they tried so many different conventional medicines, they get to the point where they um, where they basically have to try medical cannabis. Then they educate themselves and um, approach the doctors. And has you know some of the the activity around CBD and stuff like that sort of tainted this? Because one of the things that we've seen is some early you know entrants into that market were making medical claims that obviously they couldn't, and then sort of claiming that this was a cure all for you know anything and everything. Um, how does that impacted you know the medical cannabis side? Um. Talking about CBD, I think that is a very hot debate, um, especially right now with the um, new um, World Health Organization reclassification being decided upon. Um, what I can say for sure when looking at medical cannabis from a um, pharmaceutical point of view, um, a not regulated CBD market um, does not benefit the overall industry. Um, one may argue that um, CBD can be seen as a lifestyle product or as a supplement, but for sure even supplements and lifestyle products need to be um, compliant with a regulatory framework. Um, some, some companies are already offering um, CBD that has to be prescribed and that can be um, can be handled from the uh, pharmacist as a magistral reception. Um, but what, what all I can say is that a debate um, about CBD and a not clear classification of CBD does only harm the industry as a whole. Since uh, one player is, or one company is doing, uh, doing handling it that way and the other one puts it into a huge pharmaceutical point of view um, we need to have standardized um, regulations according to CBD. And um, what I can say for sure, I won't be the one um, <laughs> uh, telling other companies what to do. Um, everyone so, should have their own perception. So you've been working on this for about two years. What is the, the biggest challenge that you hadn't expected in this process? Um, basically, the... Um, the respect you have to pay to timelines and the um, correspondence you have to um, have with the regulatory authorities. So um, it is really a process to get to know your regulator, uh, your federal authority and your regulator and to know how they are working and what they are um, requiring from you. Um, when talking about this project or when talk, uh, thinking about this project in advance, you might not be thinking of all the necessary steps you need to fulfill in the German market. Since there are so many regulatory um, hurdles you have to, uh, you have to eliminate. And, um, and they're constantly changing. They are constantly changing for every state <laughs> with a, with a different uh, regulatory framework. So that would be, to my perception, the biggest uh, hurdle when entering this market. But what I can say, once you um, once you learn to cope with that uh, regulatory environment, and once you um, 
once you're operating, you are happy that you um, have these uh, strict regulatory guidelines that you can make sure, okay, if I work like this, I can assure a constant medical quality and um, and, and you, you also get certified in a way so um, that you um, that you care about the <coughs> constant quality of your products and your way of working. Yeah, I mean, that will be a, a barrier to entry for new entrants, right? Because they'll have to go through the same process and you'll be two or three years ahead of them at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so we very much appreciate you sharing your insights with us and we, um, we learned a lot. Um, we wish you well. We'd like to check in in about six months or a year and, and see how all this turned out. Um, so we will definitely stay Thank in touch and uh, follow up. Um, we wish you the best. And again, we look forward to uh, learning more about you. So where can people learn more? Uh, so you can visit our website, canify.de. You can connect with us via LinkedIn or the uh, usual social networks. Um, please feel free to send us a message. Um, and yeah, thanks for being invited here today. I think it was a great dialogue. And um, yeah, wishing you good luck with the convention. Cheers. Thank you very much. <laughs> Goodbye.